Have you ever seen lightning on a model railroad? How about a tornado? No? Well, stand by, because the storm begins in a few minutes. For most of us in the O-Gage hobby, our interest in trains was sparked by the little oval under the Christmas tree. But for Terry Johnson, it got started a little differently. Uh, when I was a kid, I grew up in Tucson, Arizona. And my parents were from Illinois and Indiana, so every summertime, they would take us back on the train for two weeks to bother the relatives back east and uh, help out on the farm. <laughs> and I think probably riding the Rock Island Rocket and some of those trains that we that were on probably was my first exposure to railroads. That initial exposure has lasted a lifetime for Terry, and this is not his first O-Gage layout. This is probably the, the fourth layout in uh, of larger layouts that I've had. I've had a couple HO layouts, I've had an N scale one. This is actually the second O scale layout, so it's maybe the fifth or sixth layout that I've built. And I wanted to have a layout that I could kind of walk into and around rather than um, one that was around the wall or rather than an island type layout. I purchased the book uh, about John Allen's model of railroading, the HO guru guy, and fell in love with his scenery, the Florida ceiling scenery and all the bridges and things like that and I wanted to try to get a little bit of that into this layout so that's what the, the original concept was based on that. Uh, the track is Gargraves, nothing atypical about that. A lot of people use Gargraves. I've got Ross custom switches. I'm using under counter NJ switch machines to fire most of the turnouts. Um, 072 minimum radius. It's probably uh, a percent and a half, two percent most uh, grade so I can run long trains without having to worry about them coming apart. I'm not TMCC or DCS uh, at this point, I'm just using conventional control. I tend to run scale locomotives with my layout most of the time. Terry has taken advantage of some of the extra space in his basement by building this long three-track staging yard. The trains get from the yard to the layout by crossing this beautiful scratch-built lift bridge. Atlas had a really nice looking bridge. It wasn't animated. Lionel had a lift bridge, but it was really too small and, and not uh, massive enough for my taste. So I scratch built one from Erector Set. And then I used uh, just Erector Set motors. There's four motors that control the bridge. Um, I did use the Atlas part, the bridge for the movable section. And then the towers are from Erector that I just built from uh, my own looking online at the different plans of the bridge and everything. When a train leaves the staging yard, it moves through the city on the upper level track above the passenger yard. Scenery Express has city backgrounds that you can buy and I used a couple of those and actually cut the lengths off of some of the skyscrapers so there were different heights and they're, they're repeated on there but it's not real obvious that they're repeated so I kind of made a large cityscape using theirs and then the backdrop, I used backdrop warehouse for the mountains of the area that I was trying to model, which would be Utah and Wyoming, um, in that area, Nevada. Miller Engineering signs are wonderful. Those add so much, they, not a person comes in without noticing those right away. They say, well, look at those signs, they're, you know, they're really cool. They do a really good job, so that adds a lot. Um, I use black lights for the night scene. So I used little dots of fluorescent paint in the building windows that you can't see necessarily during the day, but when the black lights come on, it looks like the buildings are lighted and you haven't had to run fiber optics or anything to them. It's, it's a pretty cheap way of getting a distant lighted building look nice. One of the highlights of Terry's layout is this intermodal terminal. The intermodal yard started because I had the intermodal uh, operating crane from Lionel, probably one of the nicest operating accessories that Lionel's ever made. And of course they came out with a whole string of the skeleton cars that you can run behind. Now unfortunately those are not O scale, they're more like 164th, but they fit okay if you run them behind a smaller locomotive. I think I'll, I'll excuse that and they look, they look okay that way. Uh, but that gave me a reason to have an intermodal yard where you can transfer the, the trailers from the train to the trucks and have the trucks haul them away.
Next to the intermodal yard is a whole row of classic Lionel accessories, and they're set up in a very unique way. Lionel made such neat accessories back then, and they were toys, and I didn't really want to have those so people couldn't use them. So rather than have a board set up someplace where they can just walk up and push the buttons, I incorporated them into the layout. They're all in one area. I guess if I were running this realistically like a like an HO model railroad would have run it, um, I would have the coal loader in one place and an unloader somewhere else, and the culvert loader in one place and an unloader somewhere else. But you know, when aunt so-and-so comes over to look at your layout, she doesn't want to walk all around the layout watching the train run and watching the switching move. So I put all the, uh, pretty much all the accessories in one area. And when kids or people come over that are interested in that, we run the train show with the computer and everything. And then at the end of that, when the lights are full on again, we play with the accessories, do all the lumber loading and coal loading and unloading. I wanted to make it look sort of railroady, I guess, and arches and concrete are what railroad bridges are all about, and a lot of the stations have arches in them, so I thought that, uh, so I did the arch wall and put the, the uh, push button controls accessible to the public so they could operate them without really damaging anything. That arch wall is a very creative solution to a common problem, and it looks great. Here's another bit of creativity the use of forced perspective to make scenes look deeper than they really are. The tractors and farm equipment on this string of flat cars is not all the same scale. The equipment on the flat cars in the distance are actually S scale, while the tractors on the cars close to us are O scale. Over on the mountain, trains start up the grade as they pass the engine terminal. This grade is steep and the terrain is rugged. Traffic on this stretch of shared single track is busy. No sooner has the westbound Union Pacific passenger train cleared than this eastbound Southern Pacific freight starts slowly down the hill. Here comes another westbound. The dispatcher in this stretch of railroad sure has his hands full. Mountain railroading is tough. Steep grades pose a serious operating problem and train handling is critical to... What the heck? Good grief, we've got a runaway! Those cars will never make the roundhouse curve at that speed. I knew it. Those runaway cars derailed on roundhouse curve. It seems the crew was switching at Summit and set these cars over for a moment to make their set out, and the conductor evidently didn't tie down the handbrakes, and this is the result. Over at the engine terminal, the call's gone out for the wreck train to get the derailed cars cleaned up. The wreck train is handled by this old ex-Amtrak Alco RS3. Terry's engine terminal area is small, but even here he's used his imagination to create a simple but very unique scene. The roundhouse and turntable are my weak link. Anyone who sees that is going to say, boy, that's kind of lame. But uh, one thing I do like about the engine facility is the um, the old locomotive that I, I cut the doors open so you could see inside of it and I fashioned a, a big old uh, Fairbanks Morris engine inside of it and it looks like there's changing out some parts of the locomotive so I've been pretty happy with the way that turned out and that's in the foreground of, of the scene. While Terry may want to do a little more work to expand on his engine terminal scene, the rest of his layout is absolutely stunning.
Terry's layout is an interesting mix of O-scale locomotives and realistic scenery, Lionel post-war accessories, and a few ideas pulled from show business. For example, this is Area 51. Area 51, yeah, yeah. Well, Tucson's not far from Roswell, so I think maybe I probably had some fallout of something going on, but um, it started with the 175 Lionel rocket launcher in 1962, whenever it was made, and the kids weren't buying trains any longer. They wanted to get into some space toys, and I decided, uh, let's hide it someplace, and we're thinking about hiding it into a mountain, and then the James Bond theme came up to where they had, at one point, the person uh, that was going to take over the world was hiding in a cavern, and had his uh, rockets down inside this cavern secretly above a uh, you know, operated lake that would open up and that's how I built Area 51. So I took the 175 Lionel typical rocket launcher and buried it inside a cavern and made some fun stuff around it. Terry views his layout as a stage, much in the manner that the late O-scale modeler Frank Ellison did. He has consulted with some of the Imagineers at Disney to learn how to create some of the special effects he uses. Lighting, sounds, smells, and special effects all play a role in his unique stage play. Well, when people come over, I, I kind of look at this as a, as a performance or as a show. And when they first come over, the, uh, the layout lights are lit brightly and they can hear birds chirping in the background, a lot of the ambient noise, there's station noises and uh, backshop noises will slowly dim the track lights so it becomes nighttime and then you start hearing the crickets, the stars come out, um, you see some nighttime clouds um, and then the wind starts to pick up and there's a storm brewing in the east. The uh, storm starts in the, the east and ends up in the west, kind of blows over in the height of the storm, there's lightning, a lot of different lightning flashes. I have five different lightning projectors. There's an old furnace blower motor with a, a movable veins that actually blow air into the room and blow your hair back. Ozone generator is a good thing for simulating the smell of rain, so I've got one of those that's uh, into the input of the airstream, so when the wind starts up, you can smell the ozone. There's a tornado at the height of the storm and kind of pans slowly. It's projected onto one of the walls, pans slowly across, and then dies out. And then the storm settles down, the wind stop, and you hear crickets again just before sunrise. So the daybreak actually brings a little fog. The sun cuts through the morning fog and you hear birds again and dogs and cars starting and stopping and church bells in the distance. So it lasts about 12 or 15 minutes. Terry uses the X10 system of control modules to make all this happen. Terry has combined a well done three rail O layout with a few tricks of the trade from show business to create a very unique O gauge experience. He has also created a lot of his own videos on YouTube. So the next time you hear thunder or are in a heavy rainstorm, Think of Terry's Union Pacific Wasatch Division and the lightning over the mountains.